Thanks to the Department of Social Sciences at Michigan Tech and the Cubanaw Time Traveler for supporting this video. Hey there! It's story time. For two years, engineers worked year-round to create the heaviest bridge of its kind on Earth. To build its supports, they had to send workers down into a chamber where the pressures were so high it was like diving dozens of feet underwater. To build the towers, they had to work through winters with more than a dozen feet of snow, and to finish the bridge, they had to float an elevator twice as long as a blue whale a mile down a canal and into a gap with less than a foot of margin. And in the end, the night before the ribbon cutting ceremony, a steamer was headed straight for this new bridge. And according to one report, the bridge operator had fallen asleep. This is the story of the Portage Lake Bridge. If you've ever been to Michigan's Keweenaw Peninsula, you have encountered the Portage Lake Bridge, also known as the Portage Lake Lift Bridge. It spans the gap between the cities of Houghton and Hancock, and it's the only way to drive across the Portage Canal and onto the northern part of the peninsula. It wasn't the first bridge here, but by the time workers started building it in 1957, it was desperately needed. Even then though, engineers didn't design just any old bridge. They designed a world record holder, complete with new innovations and incredible precision. But to understand why this bridge is such a big deal, it helps to go back and understand how we got here, because this was a wild ride. Okay, so this is a map of the Portage Canal today, and courtesy of Keweenaw Time Traveler, this is the canal in 1865. Back then, there were two ways to cross this waterway, by boat in the summer and across the ice in the winter. As you might guess, this was a bit of a pain for the people who lived here, but it was also an economic barrier. I've talked before about how copper mining was huge in this region for more than a century, starting around the 1840s. We're talking more than 10 billion pounds of copper that fueled nationwide technological advances like electricity, the telegram, and phones. Well, most of those mines and processing facilities, they were here on the north side of the peninsula, separated from the rest of the country. And although copper could be shipped by boat, and was extensively, there was still no way for trains to get onto this part of the peninsula. And again, the lack of a bridge could also just be a pain if you lived here. So things started to change. What I'll call the first proper bridge across the portage opened on Christmas Day 1875. It was a wooden swing bridge with one deck big enough for pedestrians and animals. When a boat needed to come through, the center section of the bridge would rotate or swing open. But oh, what happened the next day? A landslide! The day after Christmas, a landslide at a local pile of mining waste took out 200 feet of the bridge. Repairs took until spring, and people were back to crossing the ice. Thankfully though, this bridge did avoid major disasters after that, and it even got a second deck for railroad traffic in 1892. So for the first time, trains could enter this part of the Keweenaw Peninsula and carry its copper around the United States. By the mid-1890s, though, that wooden swing bridge just wasn't cutting it. So in 1895, the Mineral Range Railroad Company opened something a little more durable, a steel swing bridge. It was the same concept as the original, with two decks for different kinds of traffic and a rotating center span. And also like the old bridge, this one could not avoid disaster. Ten years after the steel bridge opened, there was a signal mix-up between the bridge operator and a steamer headed to the nearby Quincy smelter. And it was a bad day. Good news though, I did not find reports of any casualties. Minus, you know, the bridge. But hey, you can't keep a good bridge down. So after this one was repaired, it did last another 54 years until 1959. Although I didn't say it aged well. Problem one, it had less than six feet of clearance, so the bridge needed to open and disrupt traffic virtually any time a boat came through. Problem two, it doesn't get hot very often in the Keweenaw, but on at least a couple of occasions, the steel got so warm that it expanded and jammed up the bridge. Like, the fire department had to come hose it down with cold water so the steel would contract. And problem three, vehicles just kept getting bigger. 
which they did not appropriately plan for in 1895, considering cars had barely been invented. Big trucks and equipment like snow plows needed both lanes, so traffic had to stop both ways any time that equipment needed to get through. Ships also kept getting bigger, and in high winds, captains reported needing to zoom through the gap in the bridge at full speed to not crash into the structure. These numerous problems were identified as early as the 1930s, and Houghton County Commissioner C.F. Winkler started an extensive campaign to get a new bridge built. And in December 1957, it finally happened. At long last, construction began on a bridge that was not just functional, but a world record holder. The main requirement for this new bridge was that it should be able to handle four types of traffic, pedestrians, vehicles, trains, and large boats, so that freighters could come through and snag that copper. And ideally, these types of traffic would interfere with each other as little as possible. The solution was a double-decker lift bridge with a center span that would move up and down like an elevator. Except this lift bridge would be unlike anything that had been made before. And not just because that center span was a record-breaking nearly 4.6 million pounds. At its highest, the Portage Lake Bridge gets about 100 feet above the water, which was sufficient for most boats in the area back when it was built. At its lowest, the bridge is only about 5 to 7 feet above the water. So it's no good for boats, but vehicles can cross on the top deck, and trains could cross simultaneously on the bottom. Although, since the 1980s, those trains have been replaced by winter snowmobiles. But here was the big thing. This bridge was also the first in the U.S. to have an intermediate position, at 35 feet above the water. Here, vehicles could drive on the bottom deck, and small boats could pass simultaneously underneath. So for the first time, Uncle Greg and his fishing boat wouldn't create a traffic jam in two cities on his way out to the lake. And today, this is how the bridge sits all summer and into the fall. Getting this intermediate position right was deeply useful, and it also required some clever engineering. When uh, it wanted to put, retract it back, it just rolls back on these rollers, and oh, I see. on the top there's uh, is hydraulic cylinders. This is Al Anderson, a construction engineer with the Michigan Department of Transportation. He's been working on projects related to the lift bridge for about 20 years and knows just about everything there is to know about this structure. So, of course, I had to pick his brain about how it works. The design of it is quite, uh, you say, I, I guess you could say simple. It really is just a, a large pulley up in the top of the towers. There's one on each corner. And then there's a uh, wire ropes, we call them. They're lift cables that go over, over that pulley. And on the back side of the pulley, there's a big counterweight on, it, on each side, on any, one in each tower. The ropes go over the pulley, down, and connect to the lift span. The, the motors, the electric motors up in the towers, go one way or, or the other and um, just turn those big pulleys. And those motors aren't particularly large either. Because the counterweights are almost the exact same weight as the lift span, they're doing the majority of the work. As this big, heavy box goes down on one side of the pulley, all that weight creates the force to drag up the lift span on the other side. So, assuming there's no snow on the bridge, these motors only need to lift a couple thousand pounds each. In fact, with the help of some gears, you can even crank up this four and a half million pound lift span by hand if you really need to. Actually, during the uh, contract in 2015, when they did um, replace the lift cables, they actually did that up in the towers. I watched them actually moving the lift span with a wrench. There was actually two guys, one would pull and then the other, and you know, they would just take turns, uh, like, but they were moving it by hand. Thankfully though, that's not normal. For the most part, everything about how the bridge moves today is run on computers, and there's a backup generator if the power goes out. Still, what stands out to me is that a lot of the engineering behind this structure is just so simple and clever. Like, check out these blocky chains. They start out hanging from the counterweight, and then as the bridge moves, they shift to hanging from the tower itself. And that has a specific purpose. Each cable, there's 84 cables, and they weigh 2,200 pounds a piece, okay? So that's a significant weight when you think of that. 
And if you look at it and you think of the pulley in the top, there's either cables on one side of the pulley or the other, correct? So it's either on the span side or on the counterweight side. So as the bridge goes up and down, there's more cable weight on one side of the pulley than the other. So the, cha the chains are set up to counteract that. When the lift span goes down, that's suddenly 100 feet of super heavy cable added to that side of the pulley. So to keep the weight on both sides more balanced, the chains shift so that all their weight is hanging from the counterweight boxes. Meanwhile, when the lift span is up, that extra weight on the counterweight side isn't needed anymore. So the chains switch to hanging off the tower itself. Their weight isn't actually on the lift span side of the pulley, but it would also be really difficult to pull that off. What mostly stood out to me about this is that those chains, well, exist and also have a purpose. I'd never noticed them before, and now I can't unsee them. And learning about this also reminded me that the lift bridge isn't just a bridge, it's also a machine. In any case, when you lower the lift span, you want it to sit on something for stability reasons. For a bridge that only has two positions, open and closed, this is relatively easy. You just plop the lift span down on a couple of what are called bridge seats. But if you have an intermediate position, things get harder. If you built static bridge seats for this intermediate level, they would be blocking the bridge from going all the way down. So for the first time, engineers chose to make movable bridge seats. When they're needed, hydraulic rollers push them out, and when they're not, they're retracted back into the bridge. Al actually took me up into the bridge tower so I could see them up close. Now, as you might expect, building all of this was an enormous project. For one, they had to build the lift bridge while the swing bridge was still operational, because people had to get across the river somehow. And the two structures were so close together that when the swing bridge opened, its center span stuck out between the two lift bridge towers. So the lift span had to be built down the canal and then floated into place, with only four inches of clearance on each side. They had to maneuver a 260 foot long, nearly 4.6 million pound elevator into place with only about this much room to spare. There was also the issue of the piers supporting the bridge, specifically the ones built in deeper water. And of all the details in this story, I think this one surprised me the most. To drive the piers deeper into the ground, engineers mostly used compressed air and the weight of a big metal structure. But the last two or three feet of ground were all boulders and gravel, so people needed to go down there and dig that out by hand. Here's the thing though, to keep water out of this pit they just dug in the canal, they flooded the hole with high pressure air. We're talking 32 pounds per square inch. That's more than twice the air pressure at sea level and is equivalent to diving about 70 feet underwater. And this isn't just like uncomfortable, it could also be dangerous. Workers only went down there for small shifts. And when they came back to the surface, they had to sit in special chambers to allow their bodies to slowly adjust to normal pressure. Come up too quickly and they could get decompression sickness, aka the bends. This is where the nitrogen gas separates from your blood and forms bubbles in your blood and tissues. And it's a bad time. But eventually, everything came together. The piers were built and the towers were assembled and the lift span was floated into place. And in December, 1959, the bridge was completed and opened to some slightly more complicated local traffic. If you've ever been to Houghton, you've likely encountered the Uper Loop, where getting on or off the lift bridge can require a weird series of merges and turns and probably honking at people who aren't staying in their lane. That's because that part of Houghton was designed around the old swing bridge. Back then, you just went down Bridge Street and on your way. But the lift bridge was built a few feet west of that. So when it made its debut, local traffic got much more complicated. But hey, there's one more story here before we wrap up. In 1960, the night before the bridge's ribbon cutting ceremony, a steamer was headed down the Portage Canal and signaling for the bridge to open. And according to a local report, the bridge operator had fallen asleep. In any case, the bridge was not opening. So in an effort to avoid disaster, the ship threw down its anchor and snagged on underwater telephone cables. So 
Some people couldn't call home about the ceremony with the governor the next day, but disaster was finally averted. It's been almost 65 years since then, and the lift bridge is still serving this region every day. It's officially older than the swing bridge that came before it, and has aged much better. Throughout the years, it allowed trains loaded with copper to travel to the rest of the country. Today, it supports the timber industry, and of course, it makes everyday life and business possible in the Keweenaw. These days, an average of 30,000 vehicles cross the lift bridge per day, and it's also one of the few remaining functional double-decker lift bridges in the country. Most of the others have been converted into pedestrian or bike bridges or flat-out demolished. So this bridge is a piece of history, but it's also a working, well-maintained machine, sitting out here exposed to the elements and used by thousands every day of the year. If you want to keep exploring the history of this area, I really liked using the Keweenaw Time Traveler to research and find photos for this video. I'd also used it for a bunch of other projects in the past, way before I knew it came from the Department of Social Sciences at Michigan Tech. On your phone, you can pull up historical maps of the area, you can use your phone's GPS to see where you are on those historical maps, and you can read and share your own story or memory of the Copper Country. And on your computer, you can do all of that, plus find more information about specific buildings, ruins, people, and places. I've just found it to be a really fun tool for understanding this area. It's free, there's nothing to download, and you can find it at keweenawhistory.com. Thanks again to the Department of Social Sciences for supporting this video and for all of the history, archaeology, environment, and sustainability work that y'all do. Thanks to MDOT for graciously giving me a tour of the lift bridge, and thanks to you for being here. I hope you learned something that makes you think about the world just a little differently, and I'll see you soon.